Welcome. We are live. We are live. I'm Dr. Frida and welcome to Medicine in the News. This is Medical Monday where we talk about all the hot health topics that are in the headlines. We have a wonderful discussion for you today because as I'm sure you've heard, OJ Simpson has lost his life at the age of 76 from prostate cancer. And while all the headlines are talking about who's going to get his estate, if it doesn't fit, must have quit, white Broncos, all of his football career, all of these sensational things, I really want us to focus on prostate cancer. And so we'll talk about that because outside of skin cancer, it's the most common cause of cancer among men. So we'll talk about screening and how to catch it and how to actually survive well if you have prostate cancer. And then we will talk about several other headlines, including the fact that there's a medication shortage. Yeah, have you been affected? Have you gone to the pharmacy, tried to fill a med and you don't have it? Well, this is the highest medication shortage in recent history. 323 medications at least are in a shortage, including cancer meds, meds for diabetes, ADHD meds. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about Real Housewives of Potomac, R-H-O-P. Yes, it's no secret. Y'all, I love reality TV, but I especially love it when there are ways that we can learn about health, okay, and it helps others. So last night, Gordon, who is Mia's husband, made the announcement that he has been diagnosed with bipolar one. So we'll talk about the difference between bipolar one, bipolar two, some signs and symptoms, and very importantly, how to treat it. And guess what? It is April. April showers bring May flowers. But April also is Parkinson's disease awareness month. And so we'll talk about Michael J. Fox, a champion of Parkinson's disease and what he's doing for research. And then I'll tell you about some other folks who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Some may surprise you. And we'll talk about much, much more. It goes on and on, including fake Botox. Yeah, there's some counterfeit Botox, fake Botox, and people are actually being hospitalized because of the complications. Mm -hmm. And while we're on the aging tip, we'll also talk about how your actual biological age can be linked to cancer risk. So don't go away. This is Medicine in the News. I'm Dr. Frida. Stay with me. Come right back. We've got a lot to learn, and we'll have a live Q&A. Get your questions ready for me. Come on back. All right, y'all, let's go ahead and get started. I am Dr. Freed. I'm a medical doctor who has had multiple board certifications, including in internal medicine, pediatrics. I am board certified in nephrology, which is a study of kidneys and high blood pressure. I'm also board certified in obesity medicine. So as we talk about these hot health topics, I will be helped by my co-host and by my practice manager extraordinaire, Shador. Come on up, Shador. Hey, Dr. Frida. How you doing, Shador? I'm doing good. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. You have a good weekend. I did, as always. How about yourself? I had a great weekend. I really did, because guess what? We had no AAU games. And so it was actually kind of a, a calm weekend and a woosah weekend. No performances, no games, just some relaxation, hanging out with the family, doing some spring cleaning, which I loved. The kids didn't, but hey, that's what it is. All right, Shador. So shall we just jump right into these topics? Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Let's first talk about one that is really affecting quite a bit of people right here in the United States, and it is the drug shortage. We have a huge medication shortage. Let's play a clip on that. Doctors and pharmacists are sounding the alarm this morning as a nationwide drug shortage hits a record high. More than 320 medications are now in short supply. This is one of the worst times that, that we've had uh, as far as we've been tracking, uh, especially with the total number of, of ongoing and active shortages. Experts say some patients are having to forego critical medication because hospitals and pharmacies just can't get it. Cancer treatments, diabetes, ADHD, and injectable drugs, all critical and life-saving operations are some of the medications that are in low supply. I started it and everything was going really good. And then all of a sudden I can't get the dose that I'm on. Experts say there are several reasons why supply and demand, manufacturing, and raw material issues following the pandemic. They're also citing a lack of incentive for big pharmaceutical companies to produce the generic drugs they have now 
because they have become so cheap. The White House is urging Congress to pass a law rewarding hospitals that buy drugs from a wider variety of manufacturers. Yeah, Shador, this is really, really sad. And I think that a lot of people started paying attention, like as far as, you know, celebrities are concerned, to the drug shortages when some of the weight loss drugs, right, like the Ozempic, the Mount Jaro, we realized that those were in shortage for diabetic patients initially. And a lot of people had venom and hostility towards people who were not living with obesity, not living with being overweight, but who were still getting these very expensive drugs. But it's actually much larger than that. And typically when there's a drug shortage, Shador, it might last like a year and a half, but these drug shortages have been going on for quite a while, some lasting over two years, and people really are having to give up treatment. So can you imagine having a successful cancer treatment or a successful treatment for your rheumatoid arthritis or for your lupus, and then all of a sudden you're told there's a shortage and, and that's that. There's not necessarily much you can do. And what was mentioned in the clip, yeah, so sometimes there's a supply shortage. So if you need certain materials to make the drug, but the firm or the company has not made the materials, well, then you're stuck. And then especially if, say, a material is coming from overseas, for example, if it's coming from overseas and you have you know, some type of an issue with the transportation, you're stuck. So when we're dealing with certain materials, especially ones that aren't made right here in the United States, within the contiguous states, that can be an issue as well. And then if a company wants to stop making a drug, like if a firm wants to stop making a drug, the FDA actually really has no legal recourse. You can't make somebody make a drug. You know, Now, we do have certain things in place and there's like the CARES Act and we've had the, the government to try to at least intervene to say, hey, if you're going to stop making a drug, give us some good lead time, give us several months, let us know. But that's not always possible. It's not always possible. You know, if a, if a company is going bankrupt, if they don't have the supply, then if they don't have it, they don't have it, you know, then they just have to stop. So it's, it's a pretty imperfect situation. But here are some things that you can do if you go to the pharmacy and your drug is short. First, talk to your pharmacist and find out if there's any other drugs that are similar, right? Any generics or any drugs that are similar. And if so, talk to your physician. And of course you can certainly and should certainly call your physician, same thing. Is there a drug that's similar? Is there a drug that will, will have the same effect that I can just use? And if that's the case, then great. But if not, then you know, start with the simple things. If your pharmacy is out of the drug, then call around, find out different pharmacies, ask your doctor, to, you know, to go ahead and write you a prescription. What you don't want to do though, is you don't want to stop the medication without actually speaking to your physician first, because your physician might say, you know what, we have an alternative or you know what, we'll do okay without this drug for a while. And then certainly you want to talk to your local government and find out what they're doing. And in a lot of cases, when there's shortages, then sometimes the drugs are very, very expensive, right? where you want to reach out to the pharmacies or to the pharmaceutical companies to find out if they have certain programs to help you to afford the drug better. But yes, you've got drugs like chemotherapy, other cancer drugs, diabetic medications, ADHD medications. You know, you have children as well as adults who depend on certain ADHD medications, Adderall, to focus, to do well, to work, to do well in school. And so it's a big deal but just making people aware that that's what's going on. So when your doctor gives you a prescription, you want to make sure you do the research to, so that you're not in a position of shortage. Yeah. So Shador, I know we've seen that mostly with the weight loss drugs, you know, where the, the patients will call, um, you know, and, and fortunately now we have a bunch of them, right? We have the, the Ozempic, we have the Wegovi, we have the Mount Jaro, we have the Zepbound, and, you know, and there are also some other ones as well, like Saxenda, but these drugs are expensive and it's tricky getting the insurance companies to cover them. Um, another clue, Shador, is that if someone, say someone gets a drug normally in generic, but there's a shortage of the generic of that drug, you can actually write your insurance company or call your insurance company to see if they will cover the cost of the difference between the generic and the name brand. So for example, if you had to pay higher for that name brand because nothing was available, if you can show, show some type of a proof that that drug was not available for you, then in some cases, the insurance companies will actually reimburse. It's certainly worth the try. And you can ask insurance companies to actually call 
on your behalf to see if there can be a change in price. So there's, there's different things to do, but talk to your doctors, talk to your pharmacist, but just make sure you don't just stop a medication cold without consulting someone in the healthcare field, right? Yeah, that's so true. Yep, yep, yep. All right, now, Shador, let's talk about Real Housewives of Potomac. Now, I know it seems like I'm always looking for an excuse to talk about RHOP or or Married to Medicine or Real Housewives of Atlanta or, you know, all of the shows. But I'm not. I'm not. That is my guilty pleasure. But this is actually very relevant when it comes to health because Real Housewives of Atlanta, which is one of the I mean, Real Housewives of Potomac, Real Housewives of Potomac, RHOP, one of the Bravo shows. It just had the, the final episode of its three-part reunion. That was last night. That was Sunday night. And Mia's husband, whom we've talked about before here, uh, Gordon, Daddy G. We talked about him before because this on the, the, the finale, he shared that he had agreed to an open relationship in the sense that he, who's in his 70s, Gordon, you see him here, and his wife, who reportedly, allegedly, is in her late 30s, and just giving a little bit of their history, she was an exotic dancer. When they met, he was married, and she took him from his wife, or he left his wife, however you want to put it, but when they started dating, he was very definitely married, and not to her, but now he's married to her, but she is leaving him for her high school sweetheart, and he revealed that he agreed to allow her to be intimate with other men because after his prostate cancer treatments, he was no longer able to perform. He had ED, erectile dysfunction. You could check out our, our, our live where we talked about that erectile dysfunction, some possible treatments and causes as related to prostate cancer. But now he's back with more, okay, because Gordon is just keeping the, the information popping. And this is another health issue. And he shared last night that he has been diagnosed with bipolar one. Okay. Bipolar disorder one. And I realized after watching the episode that a lot of people didn't know that there were, there was more than one type of bipolar and bipolar disorder used to be called manic depressive disorder, the, the mental disease, manic depressive disorder, but he has bipolar one. And he said that and he's in his seventies and he said he was just diagnosed about two and a half years ago, but in his own reflection, he believes that he actually had the illness from the time that he was in his 20s, which makes sense, Shador, because most people are diagnosed with bipolar, bipolar disease in the late teens or in the 20s. So he was diagnosed with bipolar one. There are two types, bipolar one and bipolar two. I think the way he expressed it, he said, if there were a bipolar two, three, four, five, six, I would have those two. But it actually doesn't work like that. They're, they're, they're two different types, bipolar one, bipolar two, that's it. But we'll talk about we'll talk about those types and, you know, and go into that. I will say I was actually very pleased with him because I think it was quite brave <clears throat> for him to share because we know we're, we're getting much, much better, but we're living in an era where there's still a lot of stigma behind mental illness, especially among older generations. You know, he's in his seventies and especially among black men. Okay. It's a cultural thing where a lot of times people see having dealing with mental health as, as being some type of a weakness but he has shared that he has the diagnosis. And, and so we'll talk about it now, a few things with him. So for example, he talked about bipolar one. So I'm going to clarify exactly what that is. And something else he said about the treatment, I want to make a clarification on as well. I will say that one thing I did like about Mia is that it seems like she is very supportive of him. He said that she visited him quite frequently in the hospital and all of those things, which even though, yeah, she used to be a, a, his mistress, then his wife. Now she's got a boyfriend. Oh, and they don't know if the child that he thinks is his is actually his or her boyfriend's child. Okay, yeah, she's got some stuff going on, some salacious things. But it does sound like, on a positive note, she's being supportive. All right, so bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder, again, it used to be called manic depressive disorder, is a mental disease, a mental illness that is characterized by manic episodes or times of euphoria, and it's also characterized by depression. So in order for it to be bipolar one, <clears throat> you have to have had at least one manic episode. 
in that manic episode can be followed by hypomania or major depression or preceded by hypomania or major depression. So here's what I mean by a manic episode. A manic episode is when one is very euphoric, okay? Super high positive outlook on life, but the manic episode can also lead to a psychotic break or a break from reality. That's gonna be key in differentiating mania from hypomania. The mania can potentially lead to a psychosis or a break from reality. And so with the mania, you may have euphoria, pressured speech, where you're just talking and talking and you just can't stop talking, you keep going, you keep going and you're getting your ideas out. You may have a flight of speech or tangential thoughts where you're talking about one thing, you go off into a tangent and you're just going, going, going. You may feel invincible, okay? You could have what they used to call like delusions of grandeur where you have really an inflated sense of self-esteem. I don't mean just a typical confidence like, hey, I feel good about me, but almost delusional in some cases where you're like, you know what? I'm gonna wake up this morning. Like, like for me at my big age, if I woke up right now and I said, you know what? I'm going to be the top ballet dancer. I'm going to go be an Olympic skier, even though I've never skied a day in my life. I'm going to right now have a campaign and jump into the presidential race right now from scratch, which I don't know, maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea. But anyway, but when you're having these inflated, this inflated belief in yourself, that sounds bad, but for, for things that don't actually match up with reality. And you can have a, an issue in mania with sleep. OK, where you can go days without sleeping and you can be very irritable if you're manic. OK, we're just things that normally wouldn't bother you or some might say shouldn't bother you will make you go slap off. OK, you can be super irritable. And, you know, these are just some of the potential symptoms of the mania. And again, hypomania can have similar symptoms. But the major key is from hypomania. It's not quite as extreme as full-blown mania, and with the hypomania, it's not associated with the break from reality or the psychosis. So it's just a lower form. And you'll find out why knowing hypomania and the difference is important in just a second. So yes, so for bipolar one, at least one full-blown manic episode followed by hypomania or major depression going into a depression or preceded by depression. For bipolar two, the only difference is that You've never had a full-blown manic episode, but you've had hypomania and depression. So somewhat of a subtle difference. I will tell you, um, Shador, that Mariah Carey, y'all know Mariah Carey, because y'all probably all sitting up here singing her Christmas album song like my youngest daughter likes to do. She starts singing that Christmas album like in November, and she just like plays it all year round if she could. Anyway, Mariah Carey shared that she has bipolar 2 disorder. OK, so according to what she shared, she's that means by definition, she would have had hypomania, not the full blown mania, no psychosis, but hypomania and some some depression. So, yes, he's got the, the bipolar disorder, bipolar one. Now, here's something else, Shador. What Gordon said that I really want to make sure I clarify, because uh, Andy was asking him something like about the treatments and he was making sure that he stressed that it's not all about, you know, medications alone. It's not about exclusive medications. And he used the term like he has it under control. And I just want to make sure that anyone who is listening to the sound of my voice realizes that having it under control is not that simple. So if you have a diagnosis of, of mania, okay, of, of bipolar one, I want to make sure that you seek treatment, talk to your primary care physician, and certainly seek mental health, specifically psychiatric help because we do have medications that can be helpful. Shador, let's see. Hold on, I've got something going on on my, my screen here. Yeah, something's going on screen. Okay. Yeah, but I guess y'all can't see it. Oh, cool. <laughs> anyway, I'm like, am I alone? Where did everybody go? All right. So yeah, you want to make sure that you have, have treatment with a mental health professional. And there are certain mood stabilizers that can help certain medications that can keep you from having so many swings from the, the mania to the depression, you know, and in certain cases you may need antidepressants or you may even need antipsychotics and definitely counseling and a good support group. But when Gordon was like, oh yeah, I have it under control. And I, I just hope that he means he has it under control with the assistance of a mental health 
team. Because what happens a lot, especially with the hypomania, Shador, a lot of times patients are very productive at that phase, meaning they're feeling like they're not sleeping much. They're feeling super creative, super intelligent, getting a lot of things accomplished. And that euphoria may feel like something that you don't want to stop. And so a lot of patients will stop taking their medications because they like that feeling. They like getting things done using all 24 hours of the day. But the issue is, especially with bipolar one, is that if you keep going, that's not sustainable and it can lead to psychosis. So you definitely want to make sure you have the support of your mental health care professionals. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Oh, and Shador, who was the first person in our chat today? Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, your feedback. Uh, first person today, Miss Lou Shell Williams. All right. And she actually had a question, if you want to get into that really quickly. Oh, you guys, it's just me and you guys for a while. <laughs> Dr. Freeza should be back momentarily. So while we're waiting on her, hello to everyone, Miss Lucelle, Kathy Wilkes, Miss Marilyn Boykins. She said hello, Dr. Frida, and chat. Shaquille Oatmeal, I like the name. <laughs> hello to you. And we have Rudy Gutierrez from McAllen, Texas. Says hi, Dr. Frida. Welcome back, Dr. Frida. My goodness. <laughs> we're doing some shout outs while you were away. Had to All right. Time. Thank you for the shout outs because apparently I shouted myself out. Oh, my goodness. Let oh, me see goodness. here. So, yeah, we was getting to Ms., um, our first question. Okay. Our first person that was here, Ms. Lucelle Williams. Um, she said, I'd like to know what you think about CGMs, continuous glucose monitoring. Oh, as far as, especially for diabetes. Hold on, I happen to call my IT team, which consists of my 13-year-old daughter. Let me make sure that I'm logged out of everything, IT team. I don't want any Apple Music. I don't want any of that stuff. That's what kept popping up. All right, thank you. All right. So what do I think about CGMs? Um, continuous glucose monitoring. I actually think it is great. I think it's wonderful because what happens when you take your blood sugar just kind of on a, you know, once in the morning or you do the AccuCheck, then you're getting a snapshot in time, right? But with the continuous glucose monitoring, especially for brittle diabetics, it'll let you know when the blood sugar is fluctuating. So then you can use the proper amount of insulin or whatever diabetic medication just to make sure that your blood sugar is in tight control. And of course, we definitely want the blood sugar to be in tight control, right? Because uh, diabetes or high blood sugar is the number one cause of kidney failure, leading cause of heart disease, strokes, and, you know, and it can lead to amputations. And so, you know, if you are someone who's doing the continuous glucose monitoring, that just gives you that much tighter control over your blood sugar to help to prevent some of those compli some of the complications, Ms. Luchelle. So yeah, that's a good question. Continuous glucose monitoring. That's really one of the, the great ways to have the best control. All right, any other questions? You know, we always have tons of questions. Okay. Um, we had a couple of comments on the, um, the first topic about the drug shortage in the US. Okay. Give me just a second. Uh, one, more, one more techie thing. Oh, this thing, we're going to get this thing together. Hold on. Okay. All right. What's the drug question question? Drug <laughs> shortage question. And who has it? Not necessarily a question. Just, just comments on um, issues they actually face personally. Miss mm -hmm. Monica Hill. Hi, Miss um, Monica Hill. Welcome back. I was having a hard time getting Ozempic for my diabetes. That is the biggest one that has brought it to the forefront. And yes, as I was uh, saying, um, Monica Hill, you know, when Ozempic first came out and yes, it was meant studied for diabetes mellitus type two, 
everyone went bananas when they realized it was cost, uh, causing such great weight loss that people who had the access were getting prescriptions, even if they weren't living with obesity, even if they weren't living with being overweight. So then, yes, they came out with the Wegovy, which is the Ozempic that's FDA approved for weight loss. But even still, you have certain people, the haves and the have nots, that they had the, the $1,300 to spend out of pocket, then they were buying up the medications and we're still trying to catch up with supply because even still Ozempic, Mount Jaro, some of these other medications are not in full supply because Shador, we're having that problem, you know, where patients are calling us and there's a shortage. So, you know, I definitely would go, you know, for, if ever you run into that shortage again, Monica, I would talk to your doctor and ask, okay, if I don't have Ozempic, can I use Wegovy? Because technically they are the same drug, semaglutide. Or if there's a shortage of Ozempic, can we try Mount Jaro? That's trizepatide is different, but it's still one of the GLP-1 agonists and it still works in a very similar fashion. You know, you can ask about Zepbound, you can ask about Saxenda, which is also one of the GLP-1 agonists, but instead of a once a week injection, it's an everyday injection. That's less fun, but there are potential alternatives. And again, you might need to call around, call around and find out which pharmacies have them. But yeah, people are starting to feel that shortage. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can we touch base on one question and then we'll, we can move on. Okay. Lavender. Lavender. Hello. Welcome. So does hypermania lead to taking one's self? Oh, yes. Yes, it, it can. Not always. Not always. But I'm glad that you brought that point up because, yes, Lavender, I talked about how, you know, I talked about the euphoria, I talked about the flight of speech, I talked about being irritable and having delusions of grandeur and inflated, you know, sense of self and not eating well, perhaps unintentional weight loss. Some other um, symptoms of mania might be make, doing poor decision making, okay, where you are going on shopping sprees and splurging and spending money that you absolutely do not have and you're not going to have, but you are losing the ability to make those good decisions. And so poor decision making, it can even lead to poor decision making, poor decision making as far as hypersexuality. You might be someone who's pretty conservative as far as you're dating, but all of a sudden you're just out there like that and you're indiscriminate with the people with whom you're sleeping. And that's not your typical character. All those things can be symptoms of mania. And yes, mania is also associated with the higher risk of unaliving oneself or someone taking their own life. And that's, again, why I want to stress that even though Gordon said, yeah, yeah, now I have it under control, I don't want anyone to think that they have it under control without professional mental help from psychologists, psychiatrists as well. The psychiatrists are the, the physicians who can actually prescribe the medicine, but also having the psychologists or the counselors for the maintenance. Some practices have both, but definitely psychiatrists, someone who is able to prescribed medication, make sure that your, your primary care physician is aware also because some medications, you want to make sure they don't interfere with your thyroid, with your kidney. So sometimes the medications can affect your health. So you want to make sure your doctors are working together. But yes, people who have bipolar and people who have medic episodes, as well as major depressive episodes, but definitely the, the diagnosis of bipolar one or bipolar two can be at increased risk of unaliving themselves or of taking their lives. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Thank you. And if anyone is having thoughts of taking their own life, you can call or text 988. Call or text 988. That's a free service where there will be support for you and to help to get you out of that crisis. And certainly um, there, there are other resources as well. You know, you want to talk to people, but everyone has that free source. If you have a phone, smartphone, telephone, you can call or text 988 if you're having thoughts. Of hurting yourself. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that question up, Shador. All right. Thank you, Dr. Frida. All right. Well, we're going to keep moving. Y'all, please make sure that you like this video as you come in. Like this video and subscribe to our channel. Here on the Dr. Frida channel, we are up to over 700,000 subscribers. I'm very thankful, very appreciative. And we have so many videos where we share evidence based medicine. Okay. So today we're talking about these hot topics in the news, but we also talk about definitely kidney disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease, lupus, you name it. By now, we just about have a video out about it. And I actually have a video that I did some years ago 
on bipolar disorder. So once we're finished with this live, make sure you check out this video. But please like the video. It lets YouTube know that we are here, that we are live, and that we're sharing evidence-based information. All right. So, so far we've talked about the medication shortage. Okay. And then we talked about Real Housewives of Potomac and Gordon having bipolar disease. We differentiated between bipolar one and bipolar two disorder, stressing that you get professional help. Don't try to manage it alone. And yeah, now let's move on to another topic that made the headlines. Shador, did you know there was fake, bot <laughs> fake Botox? There is counterfeit Botox. Okay. And the counterfeit Botox or the fake Botox has actually been linked to hospitalizations in at least two states. Okay. It, it always amazes me when, when beauty kills, you know, and I talk about things, I talk about cosmetic procedures. I talk about BBLs, the Brazilian butt lifts, which are actually the most dangerous plastic surgery that that's out there. You know, and you have people who will go and get the BBLs and try to save a dollar, save a dollar to they make you holler. They'll try to save a dollar and lose their lives. And so it's so important that if you are going to do plastic surgery or even just cosmetic procedures like Botox, you want to make sure that you go to a reputable medical source and that you have it done in a medical facility. Reportedly, for the people who were hospitalized from the, the fake Botox, they were at non-medical facilities. Let's play a clip of that, please, Shador. Warning from officials, people in at least two states have been hospitalized after getting cosmetic injections, commonly known as Botox. Those injections were administered in non-medical settings. The CDC says it doesn't know the sources of the Botox products that made patients sick in Tennessee and Illinois, but an ongoing investigation by the agency is suggesting that the product was counterfeit. Symptoms of botulism include double vision, droopy eyelids, difficulty breathing, or slurred speech. It can be really dangerous. A warning from a That's wild. So that takes me, Shador, to what Botox actually is. Like people say it, but when you realize that Botox actually is botulinum toxin, then you realize it is a poison. That's what it is. It's a poison that's created by a bacterium, the bad bacteria, Clostridium difficile, and the poison actually causes like a kind of a relaxation or I guess a, a, a limited paralysis of muscles to keep your you from wrinkling or your forehead from getting the, the lines in it and all of that stuff as, as you get older. And it used to be something that we kind of thought of for older people, but now a lot of 20-somethings are getting the Botox. And Botox is another one, another one of these medications that can be quite expensive. And so a lot of times people try to save money, but you need to save money somewhere else because if you're getting the Botox from a place that's not reputable or from a person who's not actually skilled in giving it and you're not in a medical facility that could put you at risk for receiving some bootleg Botox like the, the counterfeit or the fake Botox that they had. So yeah, so the Botox, again, it actually is a toxin. And so what they were describing was a botulism-like illness. OK, meaning that instead of the Botox just being local to wherever they injected it to try to keep from having the wrinkles and whatnot, they ended up getting that toxin in their bodies, Shador. And so they had they would have had some of the symptoms that were just described, blurry vision, double vision, weakness, slurred speech. And what I don't think was mentioned that it can actually lead to paralysis, OK, being paralyzed in death. OK. So by the time these patients were, hospital, were hospitalized, you can only imagine that their symptoms must have been pretty serious at that point. So just be careful. I'm, if, if you want to go get things done, hey, do you, be you, get your Botox, get your fillers, get your whatever you want to get, but make sure that you're smart about it. You research the person who's doing it and you have it done by a medical professional at a medical facility, okay? Don't sit up down to the Amazon ordering some Botox. Don't go over to your friend's house where y'all are watching the game and at halftime, some random person pulls Botox out of the purse and they pop you in the face and you could end up with botulism illness. Just, just be smart about it. Save money somewhere else, okay? Don't, don't play with their health. Or as they say, uh, barato es caro. Cheap is expensive. You're trying to, to pinch a penny till it pops and you may mess around and harm your life. So yes, 
So counterfeit Botox or fake Botox has led to hospitalizations in at least two states. That's a mess. All right. Shador, when, when I was having technical difficulties over here before I called my, my IT tech team, Avery, yeah. my 13 year old, listen, and she, look, she could see my face because, okay, y'all, full disclosure. I love my children. I love doing for my children. But I get a lot of free labor for my children. So before I even set up here, she's the one who comes in. She turns off everything, gets everything together. So she saw my face and she's like, hey, you know, looking at me like she did everything right. But before interrupted with the technical uh, question, I was asking who was the first person. I know y'all talked about it without me, but who was the first person who signed in today in the chat? Oh, yeah. The first person was Miss Lucille. Miss yeah. Lucille. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. Any any questions or comments on on Botox that anyone has right now? No, no questions on Botox. All right. Any other questions? We'll we'll hit a question before we move on to the the next topic. Of course. Um, I will go to Theta J one. Hey, thank you for joining. Have you heard of sugar defense, and what are your thoughts about it? Of sugar defense. Yes. Probably more like okay. a natural supplement or something. Okay. Let me have you to elaborate and, and tell me what the sugar defense is. Yeah. Is it some kind of a, a supplement to protect against added sugar? Because is it a brand name? I actually have not. If she if she comes back and, and gives more details on what that is, then yeah. All right. And then now let's pop over to Miss Marilyn. Hi, Miss Marilyn. Uh Dr. Frida is really a drug that leads to one wanting stronger drugs. Let's see. Ritalin. Okay. So, so here's the thing. So when you're talking about Ritalin, you're talking about one of the, the ADHD meds. And when you're talking about a drug that leads to someone wanting stronger drugs, it sounds like you're talking about addiction, okay? Or the reward pathway. So, so let's talk about it. Anytime you have a substance, a drug, or even a behavior sometimes that stimulates the reward pathway, then potentially it can be a drug, an activity that leads you to wanting more. So when I say reward pathway, I'm talking about that positive reinforcement pathway in the brain that leads to dopamine stimulation. So I'll take Ritalin out of it for a second. And I'll use um, some. I'll use alcohol. Okay, I'll use something that has more of a negative connotation. So alcohol. If someone has alcohol, and you know they might start off where one glass gives them that dopamine release. Okay, and you have the reward pathway, and it's just like, oh, this feels really good. I have euphoria. And what happens is you have a lot of dopamine released. You have your dopamine receptors, and it gives you that good high feeling. So then the next time you go out, so you might drink your one glass of alcohol drink it again the next night, drink it the next weekend. But at some point, your body says, wait a minute, you're releasing too much dopamine. And so your body will cut back on the dopamine release and cut back on dopamine receptors to the point where when you drink one glass of alcohol, well, now you're not getting that same reward pathway. So then that leads you to want more alcohol. So then instead of the one glass, you drink two glasses. And now you're like, ah, now I have that good reward pathway. I have the dopamine so on and so on until you get a tolerance. Now, with the Ritalin, uh, you know, for people who are taking it where it's actually, you know, been prescribed by the physician, this is one of those things where I would definitely consult with your physician. And remember, what I give here on this channel is information that does not replace medical advice. But if someone is taking Ritalin and say they've been taking it for years, it is possible that they, if the Ritalin is helping, as far as helping with the ADHD, there really is pos a possibility that you can get to the point where you reach a threshold and you get a tolerance. And so then you need more. So that's the medical side of it. If you're talking about someone who's taking, Rit taking Ritalin and they're getting some type of a high or euphoria or reward for it, then yes, if they keep taking it that same amount to get that high or whatever type of a reward they're chasing, then it could get to the point where they want more, they want more. But in saying that, I'm definitely not demonizing Ritalin because it definitely has its place when used by healthcare professionals in the treatment of ADHD. So definitely consult with your doctor, address your concerns. But the short answer to your questions from a general standpoint, just an informational standpoint, 
anytime you're dealing with the medication, if it gives a certain type of a of a, a positive response, then over time you can develop a tolerance where then in order to get that same response that you want, you'll need more, you'll need more. So yeah, the reward pathway. All right, thank you, Dr. Frida. It's my pleasure. Let's do just one more question before we move on. All right. So we've actually seen this question recently in our office and you may have seen it before, but Miss Stephanie Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mom sugar is high a lot. Is berberine good? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So berberine is one of the supplements. Again, what I'm sharing with you is information that does not replace the advice of your physician. So the first thing I would do is talk, have your mother to talk to her physician or if you're you know, an advocate for her, you talk to your mother's physician to find out what your mother's doctor thinks about berberine for her, because that's going to be a matter of her doctor understanding what her, what her blood sugars are, her doctor understanding the other medications that she's on and whether or not berberine is something that is good. But just to give you information in general on berberine, it is a supplement. And at one point it was, you know, in the media and I did a, an interview on a, one of the national news shows where I was talking about how people on TikTok were saying berberine is a new Ozempic. And I'm like, no, it's not the new Ozempic, but it is a supplement that in some anecdotal studies has been shown for some people to decrease the appetite. But whereas when you're dealing with Ozempic and Manjaro, you've got people losing 15% of their body weight, 22% of their body weight. Studies have not shown that at all for berberine. Okay. We're talking about a minuscule amount of body weight as far as what studies have shown. Also, in some cases, it can decrease blood sugar, not at all in comparison to an Ozempic where you have the hemoglobin A1Cs falling dramatically. There have just been some anecdotal studies, not only in humans, but in mice showing that there can be some modest reduction. Now, that being said, there are physicians who definitely will uh, recommend berberine in conjunction with whatever medical treatment is being given. But the key word is physicians. It's being done under medical care where those same physicians can follow up the blood sugar, follow up the hemoglobin A1C, follow up the, the weight. So before running out and buying berberine, please, please have your mother to contact her physician. But it is a supplement that, that can be used to help with blood sugar. But again, we don't have huge randomized controlled trials. And again, this is information. It does not replace the advice of your mother's physician. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Frida. All right. So we just finished talking about the fake Botox. And the thing with the, the Botox, the counterfeit Botox Shador, is that, you know, this, you know, people are using that to look good and to look young externally, right? To try to look young on the outside. But there was a study, Shador, that was recently done in talking about aging on the inside. And what that study found was that People are getting cancer at younger and younger ages, and they found that a person's actual biological age, like how, never mind how you look, but how old your body is or how old your, your biological age is, there has been a link to increased cancer risk. So for example, even if you're someone who is 40 years old and you look really young and you look 30 years old or you look 20 years old, your body's biological age might be 50, 55, 60 your biological age might be older than your chronological age. So there was a study that actually figured out how to measure people's age on the inside, the biological age. And they found that the more accelerated your biological age is, the higher your risk of having cancer at a young age. Okay. So yes, we just finished talking about counterfeit Botox and trying to look young on the inside. Now let's talk about what happens when your body's old on the inside. Let's play that clip, Shador. Cancer rates in young people have been increasing for years. New research suggests there could be a link in the rise in cases. I'm with Connor from the fact check team. And what did the researchers find? Well, Didi, the researchers found that young people are aging faster and that accelerated aging 
could be leading to an increased risk of early onset cancers. Researchers from the University of Washington in St. Louis, Missouri, analyzed medical data of nearly 150,000 people between the ages of 37 and 54 from a biomedical database called the UK Biobank. The study calculated each person's age by looking at nine biomarkers found in blood, and they found people born in 1965 or later are 17% more likely to be aging faster biologically compared to people born between 1950 and 1954. And why do they think that accelerated aging is the link behind higher cancer rates in young people? Well, that's because the study found people from that biobank sample whose bodies are aging faster than their actual age were more likely to develop certain types of cancer, with the strongest links being found in lung, stomach, intestinal, and uterine cancers. All right, thank you, Connor. Mm -hmm. A disturbing trend. Courtney will join me in just a bit to discuss a new blood test that could help detect pancreatic cancer. Now, see, Shador, that completely blows my mind because they say if you're born 1965, in 1965 or later, okay, you have a 17% higher chance of having that, that old age. And it's really something because, you know, people who are born 1965 and later or 75 and later, 85 and later, these are the folks who are now, you know, having access to the Botox, to the fillers, to the, the neck lifts, to the, you know, where, you know, just different things, breast augmentations, tummy tucks, uh, mommy makeovers, all those things you think about for people who were born a little later. So then you've got people who are looking young, you know? And so like, and then even when you look at like award shows, Grammys, Academy Awards, it's like, if you see someone who actually has a wrinkle, even if they're like, you know, 65 years old, it's like, <gasps> you know, because so many people, especially in Hollywood are, are doing so many things to look very, very young, but the same people who are you know, born a little later and who are physically younger are having older biological ages. And so that's kind of tripping me out a little bit. And if you think about it, Shador, the ages for cancer screenings are changing. So like for colonoscopies, for example, the, the tests used to screen for colon cancer, it used to be pretty much, oh yeah, age 50, that's the time to get your colonoscopy. But now we're finding that young people are getting colon cancer more frequently. And so some, some societies are recommending by the age of 45. OK, and especially among black people who tend to get colon cancer at younger ages and more aggressive forms, at least by the age of 45, perhaps even younger. If you have a first degree relative who's had colon cancer at a young age, and when I say first degree relative, I mean like a mother, a father, sister, brother. OK, someone who's a relative very close to you. So, yeah. So let, let's talk about that biological aging, because I know some people are looking at themselves in the mirror, looking good, looking young. But now this might have thrown you for a loop because. How do you know if you're young on the inside? Well, the way they did this test, you know, as they mentioned, they use certain markers. And even though they have it where they plug them into a very specific formula, a specific, al uh, specific algorithm, I will share with you some of the labs that they use to measure biological age because they're the labs that a lot of you have in your your day to day labs. So one of them is albumin. OK, so for anyone who's listening and you have your my chart in front of you and whatnot, and you look at your albumin, so that's a protein produced by the liver. And in many studies, it shows a correlation with if you have a good, healthy amount of albumin, you tend to have uh, less morbidity and mortality, meaning you have a, a, a you tend to have a better survival. So, for example, you know, I'm a kidney doctor. We look at albumin every single month in our dialysis patients, and when they have albumin, especially greater than four, there tends to be a correlation with just a better quality of life. It can also be correlated with better wound healing. Well, if you have a low albumin, that could be a sign that you have a higher biological age, okay? People who tend to be older will have lower albumin in many cases. Another thing is an RDW. And Shador, that's one of the ones that if you look at the CBCs, when we're looking at the blood counts, the hemoglobin, the anemia labs, um, I often don't comment very much on RDW, but I see it, that red cell distribution width. And it's the difference between your smallest red blood cell and your largest red blood cell. And if that red cell distribution width is, is big, if it's large, that tends to be correlated with an older age. Some other things, the creatinine, which, of course, is one of the kidney labs. OK, and listen, if you on this YouTube channel, check out my videos on kidney disease. I have a playlist of kidney disease videos and I talk about creatinine as one of the markers of how we figure out your level of kidney disease or if you have kidney disease. So the lower the creatinine 
the better the kidney function, okay? So in people who have high creatinines, that can correlate with an older biological age. There's other things as well, lymphocyte percent, white blood cells. So there's a whole bunch of different different tests, CRP, C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation. If you have a lot of inflammation, that could be associated with an older biological age. So I say that to say, a lot of times people get so caught up in the physical or they're like, oh, I just want to, you know, or they want to lose weight and they do these crash diets or just uh, fasting or sometimes essentially starving. And you're doing these things to look a certain way on the outside, or you may be someone who just likes to do procedures and you don't want to exercise, but you look like you're somebody who exercises. But let me tell you, even if you look like someone who exercises on the outside, if you're not out there getting that cardiovascular activity or doing what the American Heart Association recommends, which is 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week, so 30 minutes, five times a week, if you want to break it down like that, if you're not getting the exercise and you go and look at these numbers, you might be someone who looks great. Okay. You've had your liposuction. You've had your tummy tuck. You had all of those things, more power to you. But if you're not taking care of what your body looks like on the inside with a mostly plant-based diet, drinking plenty of water, having low salt, exercising, meditating, doing those things to help you to have a low uh, biological age, then you may have an increased risk of cancer. I just thought that was a really interesting study, Shador, that I wanted to share. That is not just about the superficial, it's how old you are on the inside. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Any questions? No, no questions. I do have a follow-up from Ms. Theta about oh, yeah, sugar. Yeah. Uh, it's actually Sugar Defender. Um, she sugar says, Defender. I apologize. It's called Sugar Defender, a supplement that has a blend of natural ingredients to help control blood sugar. Now, I did a quick peek and it does contain ginseng and chromium and aims to support weight loss, boost energy, and enhance mental clarity without the use of GMOs or stimulants. Okay. Okay. So this is one of those cases. So here, here's the trick. So on the surface, it actually does not sound you know, like anything that is very alarming, but here's the issue. The way that I practice medicine is I make sure I practice evidence-based medicine. And so when you're dealing with certain supplements, oftentimes they're not FDA approved. And so then when I speak on them, I'm kind of speaking a little bit with my hands tied behind my back because they're not meeting those very definite protocols and very definite rules. That doesn't necessarily mean anything is wrong with them. It just means that I can't speak on them from an FDA um, approval. Also, oftentimes there's a proprietary blend, meaning they can share with you certain things that are in there, but there's certain blends, certain things that can be kept secret, you know, um, certain chemicals. And if they're not FDA approved, and if there's a proprietary blend, it's difficult for me to speak from an evidence-based factual perspective. What I will say is from, from what you have shared, it could be a situation of won't hurt, might help. But again, what I share is information. And as far as the information in the large randomized controlled trials and the clinical based you know, evidence we have as far as having a healthy blood sugar, we know that having mostly plant based diets will help. We know that exercising regularly will help having a good water intake. And if you're someone who's hemoglobin A1C is elevated or someone who has high blood glucose levels, then in some cases you may actually need medications to assist in addition to a healthy lifestyle with maintaining good blood sugar, avoiding added sugar. Okay. And make sure you check out my video on what sugar does to your body, what added sugar does to your body. What I do recommend is that you take this to your physician, your primary care physician and that physician understanding your labs um, will make a recommendation and they'll probably say a similar thing like, Oh, you know, it's a proprietary blend. I can't promise. But if it feels like it's something that won't hurt, might help. A lot of times physicians will say, I'll tell you what, go ahead. If you really want to give it a try, I don't think that it's harmful, but come right back in in a couple of weeks and I'll check your labs. I'll check your blood sugars and see how it goes. So, yes. So I definitely want to make sure you're doing the things that we know will help blood sugar. You know, as far as not having a lot of added sugar, not eating a lot of processed foods, prepackaged foods, doing all of the things and making sure that your hemoglobin A1C and your, your glucose is followed by your doctor. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate everyone who's in the chat, everyone who's here supporting. Please make sure you like this video, that you subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. Please, and tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to come on in. And when you hit that notification bell, you'll be among the first to know 
when we're doing these. And we're doing these on Mondays. This is Medical Monday. I'm Dr. Frida. This is my co-host and my practice manager for over a decade, Shador. And we are giving you evidence-based information, talking about all of the highlights, the headlines. And yeah. All right. Any other questions before we move on um, to our next topic? Oh, I think we should get to the matter at hand. Let's get the people what they're waiting for, Dr. Frida. <laughs> They're waiting for O.J. Simpson, O.J. Simpson, one of the most famous slash infamous people has died at the age of 76 of prostate cancer. Please play that clip, Shador. <clears throat> this is a CBS News special report. I'm Gail King here in New York. We have just learned this morning that O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. His agent said he had been suffering from prostate cancer. Now, this news comes on social media from the family of the former star running back who was tried and acquitted for the murder of his ex-wife and then found liable for her death in a lawsuit. Simpson's life story is extraordinary. He grew up poor in San Francisco, became a sports legend who won the Heisman Trophy while playing for the University of Southern California back in 90, 1968 and set records in the NFL and then moved into acting and TV work. He was one of the most desired commercial endorsers in the 1970s and 80s, but his career fell apart in 1995 when he was accused of stabbing his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and a friend of hers, Ron Goldman, in her home in Los Angeles. He was arrested after a long, infamous police chase that lasted for hours. After one of the most controversial trials in recent memory, Simpson was found not guilty of both murders. Goldman's family then sued O.J. Simpson and... Yeah, that was all the talk on and Thursday. We were in clinic, we were in the office, Shador, and we're like, yeah, that, that made major news, his death. You know, and everyone's been talking about, you know, the the white Bronco and that chase. And now I know this morning on the news, they're talking about the estate where the attorney over his estate is saying that he does not want to finish paying off the families <coughs> because he owed them like what over $33 million in the civil suit. So even though he wasn't criminally charged, he lost that $33 million in the civil suit. And, you know, he's saying he doesn't want to give it to them. He wants to pay IRS, other things like that. All of those things are going on, but let's talk about the prostate cancer that OJ Simpson had. And apparently he was in hospice before he left. So prostate cancer, Shador, you, you already know, is so common. Outside of skin cancer, it's the most common cancer among men. It occurs in one in seven men worldwide. And so it's a huge, huge issue for all men and specifically black men, it tends to affect black men more than other men and more black men tend to get it. And we're not completely clear on why that is. It also tends to occur in black men at younger ages and it tends to be more aggressive, okay? So according to the American Cancer Society, if you are at average risk, then you should discuss screening with your doctor no later than by the age of 50. If you are at high risk, then you should discuss screening for prostate cancer by the age of 45. Spoiler alert, all black men are considered to be at least at high risk, okay? So if you are a black man and you are listening to the sound of my voice, then according to the American Cancer Society, it's recommended that you discuss getting screened for prostate cancer. Yes, I know a lot of people think 45 is a new 35. They feel young. They still got on their skinny jeans and their pointy toe shoes or whatever the young people are wearing. But 45 is the age where if you are at high, ri at high risk, then you should discuss getting screener. And then if you, if you are at very high risk, then you should discuss screening by no later than the age of 40. And so by very high risk, I mean that if you have um, a first degree relative or more than one first degree relative, like a father or a brother who has prostate cancer, then you want to discuss getting screened then. So here are the screening tests, Shador. You've got the, the blood test, the PSA or prostate specific antigen. And that's a test that can let you know if you have a, a risk or that if you need further evaluation, if it's elevated. Now, it can be elevated, not just by prostate cancer. You can have an elevated prostate specific antigen if you have prostatitis, like inflammation of the prostate. There are other things that can do it as well, but certainly that's one of the screening tests. And then also the DRE or the digital rectal exam, where yes, a finger is inserted into the back passage, we'll say, and the prostate is able to be felt or palpated from there. And so that's um, one of the, the screening tests, okay? There's also prostate MRIs, prostate ultrasounds. And if there is a suspicion or if there needs to be a further diagnosis, then a biopsy, 
okay, actually taking a sample of the prostate can let you know. Here's the good news, even though I gave the gloom and doom about how common prostate cancer is and how it's more aggressive in, in Black people, more common in Black people. Here's the good news. If prostate cancer is detected early and treated properly, the survival rate is very high. So I know there's a huge fear, especially with these young men, the young men in their 40s, because you still feel young, you are young in your 40s, but it's time to get screened for cancer, you know, if you if you meet one of the those criteria. And we have so many treatments now, okay? You can have, if they catch it early and it's just contained within the prostate, then you might need the whole prostate removed, <clears throat> a prostatectomy, or you may need uh, radiation or chemotherapy or cryotherapy. There's all kinds of therapies for it. And I will say that for most people who are diagnosed with prostate cancer in the early diagnosis, they have no symptoms. So if you're listening and you're someone who's a man or who was born a man and you're like, ah, I'm fine, everything's working fine, I'm urinating fine, my love life is fine, I don't have it. No, most people who are diagnosed early on don't have symptoms. But if you do have symptoms, they can include difficulty urinating or getting up many times at night to use the restroom. Okay, you might have nocturia or even blood in the urine. But again, having no symptoms is going to be the most common symptom. No symptoms early on. And you definitely want to be diagnosed early so you can have an increased survival rate. So yes, with everything that's going on, Shador with OJ in the headlines, I wanted to make sure that at very least we you know, use this as a vessel to give health information on prostate cancer. All right. And so I, I know it's time to wrap up. I do want to do it. I want to do a couple of these questions though. But before we go out, April is Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. Let's just play that really quickly. And I tell you what, um, I will give more information on Parkinson's this week. Okay. I'll share it in a short or real, a short video while I'll go into details on Parkinson's. But let's just play really quickly um, a little bit on Michael J. Fox. This morning, we're hearing exclusively from award-winning actor and activist Michael J. Fox, ahead of his foundation's annual fundraiser this Saturday here in New York City. Fox was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 1991. He was just 29 years old. Now 62, he's lived with the disease for more than half his life. Since its creation back in 2000, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has funded nearly, check this number out, $2 billion worth of Parkinson's research. We caught up with Fox to talk about the evolving changes of living with the disease and the global impact of his foundation. We didn't have money, we didn't have a voice, and, and I thought, well, I could step in for these people and raise some, raise, raise, raise some help. After more than three decades of living with Parkinson's disease, Michael J. Fox is raising a lot more than just hell. It's impossible to put into words. He's me. raising the bar and a whole lot of money for Parkinson's research. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to shed a little light on Parkinson's since, again, April is Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. I'll give you more information and you'll be able to check it out on my IG channel. Follow me at Dr. Dot Frida. And that's where you'll find where I, I definitely give evidence-based medicine. A lot of times I'll give it to you in short bites and not just talk to you about what's going on in my everyday life. So follow me there and make sure you like this video and subscribe because I'm telling you, we have a wealth of information. But yes, April is Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. And just real quickly, some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease will include, can include a, a really kind of a, a stiff face, okay, an expressionless face, a slow walk, stiff walk, you might notice a tremor at rest, right? A shakiness of the hands at rest. But then when you go to reach for something, the tremor may stop, okay? You may get a pill rolling where your fingers are just kind of doing this, like you have a pill in your hands, um, slurred speech. There, there's all kinds of, of symptoms about of Parkinson's disease. But if I'm saying these and that sounds like something that's familiar, make sure you consult with your physician or you have your loved one to consult with their physician about Parkinson's disease. And a few people who have it, and, and some may surprise you, um, Muhammad Ali had Parkinson's disease. The former president, George H. Bush had Parkinson's and Reverend Jesse Jackson has Parkinson's disease as well. There are other people as well. But Parkinson's Disease, disease Awareness Month, I'll be giving more information um, on Instagram and on YouTube. All right. As we head out, can we catch a couple questions? Shador, some of the people who asked questions today. Yes, please. Can we talk to Ms. Bertha? Hello, Ms. Bertha. Ms. Bertha says, hello, doctor. My doctor Hi. diagnosed me with CKD, a GFR of eight and creatinine of 6.80. Was wondering how long before I reached six or lower. 
Okay. So Ms. Bertha, I'm sorry that you have been, have that diagnosis. So for chronic kidney disease, first off, I want you to make sure that you either write this down or remember or go to it now. On this very page on my YouTube channel, Dr. Frida, I have a video on CKD stages explained where I go into detail to really make sure you have a good understanding. But briefly, I'll tell you there are five stages of kidney disease. One is the best, okay, where you essentially have normal kidney function, but there might be something else going on with your kidney anatomy. And then five, CKD stage five, is a stage where you're actually already eligible for dialysis or a transplant, for dialysis or a transplant plan at stage five. You're considered to be at stage five if your GFR, glomerular filtration rate, is less than 15, which it sounds like it sounds like your race is. That being said, there are definitely patients I have, and Shador, you know, we see them in the clinic all the time, who have single digit GFRs. And while we prepare them for transplant, we prepare them for dialysis, we make sure we, we empower them. We don't actually dialyze them until they meet the indications for dialysis. And so there's no set time, but there is no such thing as a CKD stage six. Stage five is it. So I urge you very strongly, if you're having any symptoms. And again, what I'm giving you is information. For you, definitely you should be seen by a kidney doctor, a nephrologist. And if you're having any uh, urgent symptoms, then you should be seen. It's recommended that you actually be seen urgently or by the emergency department if you are having a tremor that could be associated with kidney disease. If you're having nausea, if you're having vomiting, if you're noticing forgetfulness, okay? If you're noticing some other potential um, symptoms of having severe or late stage kidney disease could be if you are having uh, uh, easy bleeding, easy bruising, if you have a decrease in the amount of urine you're making, if you're short of breath, for sure. Shortness of breath is something where you want to activate the emergency medical system or call 911. If you're having any chest pains, okay? If you're having a whole lot of swelling, edema, contact your healthcare provider. But again, if it's shortness of breath, chest pain, or a neurological issue, then you want, it's an emergency. Okay. You want to activate 911. Here's the most important thing. Just because you make urine, that doesn't mean that you don't have a kidney issue. A lot of times when I talk about late stage kidney disease, I say, think of it like a strainer of spaghetti. You might boil your spaghetti in the water and you could pour the spaghetti in the strainer. You could be getting rid of water. Okay. Water being urine but still have the toxins in your body, toxins being spaghetti. So an EGFR of less than 15 is very advanced kidney disease. And you definitely want to consult with your physician and you want to make sure you don't have some of the other complications like high potassium, which can lead to heart problems, high phosphorus, some of the other problems. So it's very urgent that you speak with your nephrologist, your kidney doctor, or if you're having some of the more life-threatening symptoms, call 911. OK. And, you know, and also very importantly, talk about transplant. OK. Talk about kidney transplant. Ask about that. And if it's something that seems like an option for you, my patients tend to do very well with their kidney transplants and, and live life closer to the way they're used to living life. And, yeah, you know, when it comes to dialysis, no one's no one really feels like running and signing up for dialysis. Me, me, pick me. You know, it's not something that people love to do. But here's what we have to remember. When the kidneys, when both the kidneys stop working, you cannot live unless you have some form of kidney replacement like dialysis or transplant. So while, you know, no one really loves the idea of doing dialysis until you get a transplant, that is what allows you to still enjoy life, enjoy your loved ones. You know, because, again, if both kidneys stop working, it's not compatible with life. You cannot live. I definitely wish you the best. And, yeah, talk, talk to a kidney doctor right away, please. All right. Thank you, Dr. Frida. Yeah, Ms. Thelma. Hi, Ms. Thelma. She says, I'm just wondering or concerning the use of Ozempic. I have a friend who is taking Ozempic and is a diabetic. They have lost weight, but their sugar levels are still high. That's very interesting. So again, definitely they want to consult with their, their primary care doctor or even their endocrinologist, their, their diabetes specialist. It's not unheard of, I will say, because there are patients who I've had who've come to me, you know, kidney patients, and they're on Ozempic, and their doctor might have them on another medication as well for blood sugar, blood sugar lowering. So if that blood sugar is not meeting that target, okay, if the hemoglobin A1C is not 
being lowered properly, I definitely recommend that your friend, your friend should go and should talk to the endocrinologist, the diabetic, diabetic specialist to find out if the ozempic dose is right. Okay. Perhaps they need a higher dose or if the ozempic medication is right for them, maybe they should try Mount Jaro or one of the other more, you know, older tried and true medications. Maybe they need insulin. Okay. Maybe there needs to be a change in the diet as far as the, the added sugar in the diet. Maybe there needs to be more plant-based diet. So, you know, things of that nature, but definitely your friend should consult his or her physician and know that your friend's not the first person this has happened to. I've seen patients where it takes more than one medication, even more than just Ozempic to, to get the blood sugar down. Yeah. One good thing about the weight loss, especially if it's an abdominal weight loss, like they've lost belly fat or visceral um, adipose tissue, losing that belly fat is something that can help to increase the body's sensitivity to insulin. So a lot of times just weight loss alone can help with blood sugar. But yeah, make sure your, your friend is following the physician's advice very closely. All right. Thank you. And while we're on the topic of diabetes, um, this is for Ms. Matilda. Hi, Ms. Matilda. Hello, Dr. Frida. Why is it that my doctor refused to give me a CGS monitor? I believe one for your arm. He states because I am not on insulin. I only take glucophage. Okay. So a lot of times when they do the, the continuous glucose monitoring, it's for, uh, uh, for diabetics who have really labile glucose levels, sometimes up, sometimes down. And of course, the best thing, the best person to answer this question is your physician, okay? But I'm just kind of theorizing on, on what the possibilities could be. If you're not actually diabetic and you're on the metformin or the glucophage, then perhaps your doctor feels like your blood sugars are stable enough where they're not up and down, up and down labile. I've had patients who might have blood sugars that are, you know, 350 and you give them the tiniest tap of insulin and they'll drop and get blood sugar of 50. So those are the people when you have people who are brittle diabetics, as they used to call them, or who have labile up and down blood sugars. Those are the ones where it becomes really life threatening for patients who tend to have more steady state or predictable insulin levels. Like if the hemoglobin A1C is pretty much stable or if it's steadily trending in a, in a direction, perhaps your doctor does not feel that the continuous glucose monitor is necessary. But again, what I'm giving you is information. You definitely want to have the conversation and literally ask your doctor the reasons. Is it something like what I said, or is it something else? You know, ask them, hey, is it the cost? If I'm willing to pay out of pocket, will that work? Like, it is your right to ask the questions to your doctor. So if you're not feeling satisfied, I will certainly follow up and ask your doctor's reasoning. But I will say, it's not unreasonable in many cases for a doctor to make a judgment if they feel like a patient's blood sugar is not up, down, up, down. If they feel like it's pretty predictable, then they may not feel like a continuous glucose monitor is necessary. All right. Mm -hmm. Be well. Go yeah. with, um, Ms. Laverne, Dr. Frida. Hi, Ms. Laverne. Great information. I always learn something specific yeah. about better to take care of my health. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Please, on your way out the door, like this video, like this video, subscribe to our channel, Dr. Dr. Frida. We'll be back here on next week. Same bat time, same bat place, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here for Medicine in the News on YouTube Live for our Medical Mondays. We'll answer more of your questions live, live and on stage. We'll talk about more of the hot topics, just like we talked about this week. So just pay attention and make sure you comment. And if you have any health hot topics in the news, you know, coming up to next week, let us know and we'll see if we can, can cover those. Thank you, Ms. Shador, as usual. And um, hey, we'll see y'all next week. Thank you for joining. I appreciate you.